uh, the show. Thank All you. right, sounds good. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Uh, so I'm Jason Pratt. I have been, I'm the um, Senior Manager of Partner Development within PCA. I've been at Positive Coaching Alliance for a little over 12 years. Um, I cover lots of different regions around the country and the world, um, but not Canada, that's right. Um, I'm physically located in Philadelphia. Um, grew up as a kid in New York as a Rangers fan. And uh, uh, yeah, I guess that's enough about me. Definitely excited to talk with you all uh, today and beyond. And then I definitely would like to introduce Ryan Virtue, who, um, Ryan, I'll let you do your own your own thing, but basically uh, I'd ask Ryan to join for the, the reason that was expressed already, which is, you know, Canada is, is close to his heart. So Ryan, I'll let you introduce yourself. Perfect. Thanks, Jason. And, and Wally, first of all, thanks so much for putting this group together. I think it's awesome that this group just exists and you have regular touch points with each other to talk about these issues. Um, and I just want to say, Hal, thanks so much for being a trainer and obviously a huge supporter over the years at PCA. That's fantastic. Um, so I am Ryan Virtue, uh, proud Canadian. Uh, I do reside in Cleveland, Ohio area. So believe it or not, I'm actually a horrendous Canadian. I was not a hockey guy personally. I played baseball. Uh, that was my ticket into the country, but I try to make up for it because I married an American ice hockey player. So uh, we're a little messed up and backwards, but I've been with PCA for five years now. Um, so not quite as seasoned as, as Jason, but um, I believe wholeheartedly in everything that we do. Uh, coached at multiple levels. I actually worked at the University of Calgary um, for three years. I was the event marketing promotions coordinator, and then I was the pitching coach for the club baseball program there. Um, so I've had a couple stints on and off again, native of Ottawa, Ontario. So uh, I am a Sens fan, although that's tough to admit sometimes. Um, but uh, just thankful for the opportunity to be here with you all and, and to, first of all, learn um, and hopefully help shed some light on some of the things that, that we're doing through PCA. And um, if there's opportunities to support what you're doing in Canada, um, I'm all ears because I, again, believe wholeheartedly in what we do and the impact that it has on our kids. So I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, the last person, Tom Malloy, I, I, I would like to introduce him to, to a little bit because Tom is on the, uh, is my age, which is like 75 and over. He goes on the ice and skates with uh, ex-pros the same age, three times a week. And he's still coaching. He's working with a U13 uh, AA girls team. He's taught high school, coached all sport, uh, junior high school, coached all sports there. But his primary experience is hockey, having worked in Europe, uh, Austria, Finland, with, with Russian coaches, and a wealth of knowledge in terms of uh, educational sports. He's a teacher like uh, myself and Barry, a former teacher. So, uh, Tom, I don't know if you want to add anything, but uh, just say hello to the group and uh, talk about whatever you want for a, a minute, and then we'll, we'll get on with the, the talk. Oh, that was a good intro there. Uh, I just want to listen to everybody and see what's happening. Okay. Well, I guess my we're obviously of the same mold. It's it's like we're speaking to the choir here, and I, I intend on I am recording this and I'm going to edit it and spread the word, sort of spread the gospel. Um, I, I have a couple of uh, phrases about our group. Uh, we're, we're called the No Dead Sharks Club, which sometimes is referred to as the Sharks. And Tim, uh, I wonder if you could just explain how that name came about uh, in terms of the uh, coffee meeting and then you providing the, the title and where the background. Go ahead. Uh, speaker, Tim. Your speaker. Yeah, really, really, really okay. quickly. Sure, Jason might be familiar, not as likely Ryan, but um, when we started meeting as a group and always trying to get better and move ahead as coaches, uh, it occurred to me like a scene in the old Woody Allen movie, Annie Hall, where they're sitting on the plane side by side and, you know, he's explaining to her about their relationship issues and how, you know, sharks in the water always have to keep moving forward in order to stay alive. Uh, to get the 
air through their gills and he says i think what we have on our hands is a dead shark so we're trying to avoid dying and we're always trying to move forward and need to move forward so we're we're sharks so really quickly if you haven't seen it ryan you need to check it out it's a great movie okay. anyway go ahead go ahead jason or yeah Paul. jason please yeah i mean i think that it's fantastic that i love the the symbolism behind that. I, I was talking with Michael Benelli some time ago and he was describing your your efforts here every Thursday. And I said, it sounds like a hockey Algonquin round table or something like that. <laughs> he said, essentially, yeah, essentially. So we're really excited to, to chat with you. And, and like Ryan said, learn from some of the things that, that you're talking about. And if there's anything that, that we can offer up, happy to help in any way that we can too. My, uh underlying wish from this is that um, the PCA model becomes a part, a mandatory part of governing bodies, education programs. So I think what I'd like to find out uh, is what we've gone through this and talked many times, Ryan, about um, the need for ethical coaching modules. The technical modules are fine, but there is absolutely no education except at the higher levels of how to deal with issues. So I'm curious about at any age level of playing and coaching, what are the resources and the programs that you offer and I would, uh, Jason, to consider the, the market that you guys have, I believe, is a group that are like-minded, that want to buy in, and they join you. We're trying to influence Hockey Canada in particular, and Barry is a big advocate of improving the culture of our sport in this country. And as you know, Brian, uh, it's in a bad in a bad shape, and I think... It's caused because of the lack of education, uh, ethical coach education from the lowest level up. So can can Jason uh, and, and you both talk about the resources, how you've made use of them, and and uh, the things that seem to be working that, that have the biggest effect? Go ahead, Jason, and then Ryan, chime in whenever you want. Yeah, thank you for that. I think, um, you know, one of the keys to, we, we talk in terms of partnerships and we really are looking to kind of shake hands with organizations around the world in a way that does provide resources that can be absorbed and taken advantage of. They, you know, I would say the cornerstone of the work that we tend to do is through these workshops. We have um online self-paced workshops i think the real bread and butter are the live workshops that we offer um where we dig in with we have seven different coach workshops that an organization could pick from we have five different athlete workshops to pick from we have parent workshops we have board of directors workshop and organizational leadership and there's there's a ton of ways that, that through these live, interactive, conversational workshops that we can provide some pretty important support while also our own trainers taking the opportunity to learn best practices of what the various organizations are doing out there, schools, youth sport organizations. They're all doing some things in fairly unique ways. And so us being in a position to meet with so many of them means we're in a great position to learn best practices. And also learn what have they tried that hasn't worked and why, because there's a lot we can learn from those things as well. So those workshops, I think, are a cornerstone component of the, the resource sharing. Um, but then there's thousands of additional resources available through PCA beyond that as well. Um, again, resources for each one of those groups, the coaches, the parents, athletes, et cetera, that um, might just fill a hole as necessary in a moment. You know, there might be an organization that had a maybe a coach came to the organizational leadership and said, I'm struggling with this in this area. And there and and that organization didn't already have a resource in that area. Um, well, we've got, you know, there's a pretty good chance we over 20 some years of doing this that, you know, we may have a resource in that area. And if we don't, 
we've got a great network of people that can go dig and see what we can find you in terms of support. The ultimate goal is to act as a youth and high school and really college sports consultant to have in your back pocket. So that's that's my 30 seconds on it, but Ryan, I'll certainly encourage you to chime in as well. Yeah, thanks Jason and, and great overview. And, and Wally, I love the way you position this question using the, specifically the phrase culture, because that's ultimately what we're here to shape. And I know we're talking to a bunch of coaches right here, but coaches are only one aspect of, of who creates the culture, right? And um, I would say a lot of a lot of the challenges that that we honestly face in in the sports industry is um, is a lack of of true leadership, right? We where we have you know basically a, a culture is purely determined by the lowest level of behavior that's permitted to occur, um, and there's just a lot of permitting in today's society because somebody doesn't want to speak up or feel like they're speaking out of turn, and so we're not doing a great job at holding coaches and families accountable to their own behaviors. And obviously that has a negative impact on the kids experience and, and everything that we've seen, um, you know, happening through Hockey Canada and everything else right now. And so the best way for me to describe culture is really like a four legged stool because there's four primary constituent groups, you know, that create our culture and Tim, I see your hand, so I'll, I'll jump to you here in a second, but, um, those four primary cultural groups are, are uh, um, con constituents, sorry, are leadership. So how do we make sure leadership understands and knows their own organizational mission, um, has everybody on the same page so we can really help effectively lead others. Um, second leg of this tool is coaches, right? And we train coaches, as you may all know, as, as double goal coaches, which is goal one and the scoreboard's on, we want to strive to win, right? But the second more important goal is, is we need to teach life lessons. Um, and that's ultimately kind of where we try to amplify uh, our work is, is on that life lessons and, and capitalizing on those opportunities. The third leg of this tool is parents. So we do a ton of proactive parental education um, that's really centered around that life skills side of things. The on ice product is a responsibility of the coaches and the players, right? Parents need to know and understand what their unique role in this environment, and they should have a partnership with the coach focused on those life lessons aspects. We have a lot of division right now where coaches will say, hey, stay out of it. I don't want to talk to you about your kid. Don't talk to me about playing time. Don't talk to me about any of this. And it creates a barrier for parents who ultimately have the best interest in their kid at mind and at heart, even if they their actions don't necessarily align with what they're trying to do. Um, so we need to help them, right? And then the fourth leg of the stool is obviously the kids themselves. So we do a lot of basically entry level sports psychology work with athletes um, to help them wrap their mind around how do I make myself better, make my teammates better and, and honor and respect the game, you know, which is where we talk about developing a high level of respect for rules and officials and opponents and teammates. Um, so we take that holistic approach and try to figure out, hey, where are the biggest gaps organization to organization? And we try to take both a, a top down and a bottom up approach. So we want to work with the national governing bodies and bring training and set expectations and build this into the curriculum and requirements of coach education. But at the end of the day, the culture work really happens from the individual organization level up, right? The ones that can train and have access to all their parents that can set the expectations for coaches and hold them accountable, can bring this education to the kids directly we want to do board workshops to make sure their board and leadership is all on the same page. So that's really the bottom up approach. While we also want to be able to work holistically and take the bottom down approach to set expectations from the governing bodies. So um, I know I just threw a lot at you, but I'm going to pause there because Tim, I do see your hand up and, and would love to um, hear your thoughts. Whoop. Yeah, sure. sure. Thanks. Um, yeah. I just wanted to uh, really quickly. Uh, yeah. After listening to Jason, if uh, either you or Jason could illuminate us and anybody who sees this, like what what are the basically the titles of the seven modules you had for have for administrators, uh, the five you have for athletes, and sort of a follow up to that, I think Jason is now familiar with Wally's mission statement exercise. Like where where you think that might fit in? It's, you probably do something like that yourselves already, but. Uh, just wanted to, you know, uh, get a better picture of 
what's on offer with with your group because it sounds uh, you know pretty positive obviously yeah ryan if, if you can take the lead on uh, addressing the the workshop options by title and you know maybe brief description then i'll jump in on the on the wally mission statement activity absolutely so first of all just kind of using that four-legged stool analogy leadership we have uh, a, a workshop called leading your organization so really what we try to do is help leadership take a step back from the day-to-day -day grind obviously a lot of leaders are volunteers or the pay is as a part-time pay you still got another job to do right and so it's really easy to get caught up in what's next what's next and not really reflect and look at big picture so we want to try to create you know, an environment through that workshop where everybody that's in the room, any board member has the opportunity to share their opinion of what their vision is for that program. Um, and then we wanna really look at what are the things we do really, really well as an organization that we should celebrate, right? And we need to continue to do well and how can we amplify those things? But then at the same time, what are some of those things that we don't do well and should be prioritizing? And that may align with some of our program or that may be something completely different. Like we need better facilities and better equipment, right? Which is not what we do, but that if that's a priority for the organization, we wanna make sure that organizational leadership is able to talk through those priorities for their unique program. So that's the one for leadership. Um, and the opportune time for that is really when there's, you know, anytime we get to work with an organization for the first time, that is always a highly recommended workshop. Um, but then when there's leadership transition, and I know in Hockey Canada and a lot of programs around the country, we're going through a lot of leadership transition. That's really an opportune time because you got a lot of folks who have been involved for years and you got a lot of new folks that are trying to bring fresh and new ideas. And so how do we blend those thoughts? And that's really a great opportunity to utilize a workshop like that. Um, on the coaches front, the first workshop we typically start with is simply coaching for winning in life lessons right it's very self-awareness raising so that's a lot of our goal in all of our work is if we increase self-awareness then we can start building and continue to educate and, and raise um you know different opportunities and, and continue to build upon their education but it starts from a base level of self-awareness and, and realization so um, that's really what that workshop is we have a workshop called culture practices and games. So once we're a little bit more self-aware, um, now we can focus on some others, our students, our, our athletes, our parents, right? How do we take control of the environment? Um, and then we've got some deeper dives where we talk about mastery, which is really coaching for peak performance. Um, we have positive motivation, which is a lot more centered on um, how do we build these kids up, right? We use a, a magic ratio five to one, um, positive to negative interaction to create the optimal relationship between any two individuals. So how do we be more intentional about recognizing positive effort when the results might not be there? Um, because at the end of the day, the process and positive effort is what will over time yield um, more of those successful outcomes. Um, so that's another workshop. And then we do have a whole uh, coaching with empathy. Um, workshop. So obviously the stresses and anxieties of our kids today are vitally different, are, are worlds apart from what ours were. Even for me, I'm 38 years old and, and the world our kids are growing up in now um, is night and day different than when I grew up. Um, and it's night and day different than when you all grew up. So how do we meet these kids where they're at and continue to build them up and be empathetic about the world that they live with it? Mm -hmm while still having our expectations um, that are realistic, um, you know, in terms of, of how we want to lead them. So, uh, and then we have a whole sports can battle racism, um, you know, arm to our programming as well for coaches. And so, um, again, a lot of self-awareness raising, um, how do we, you know, make sure we're building community and, and creating an environment where all kids, regardless of, uh, any differentiation from any of us are, are welcome within the environment that uh, that we're pushing forward. So that's that's the coach side. The parent workshop um, is really it's titled. I'm, I'm going to look at this to cheat here um, because we call it the second goal parent workshop, but it's called developing winners in life through sports. Um, so again, very centered on uh, the life skills side, and then the athlete side. 
I'm getting a little long-winded here, so I apologize. But on the athlete side, um, we've got a hierarchy of program. The first one is an introductory level to becoming a triple impact competitor, which is, again is very self-awareness raising. Uh, we have a social media workshop to help kids understand how to best position themselves and build their personal brand and that side of things. How do you, how do you interact within the social space that again, didn't exist when I was growing up. Um, we have our, uh, making teammates better workshop, which is a lot more leadership centric. Um, so again, triple impact competitors, more self aware, awareness raising, um, our leading, uh, your teammates are making teammates better workshop is more leadership driven. Um, and then we've got for some of the younger kids, um, we've got what we call a junior triple impact competitor, which is a whole lot more high energy activation, 20 minutes, basically become a rotation um, or a stop on the rotation of a, a practice. And um, we're building them up and slowly introducing um, the concepts of, of being a triple impact competitor. So there's a large range there. And ultimately, um, you know, my role within all this is anytime I have an opportunity to talk to an organizational leader, really figuring out where they are and what of our, which of our programming areas are going to meet them where they're at and, and how do we continue to take one step and then continue to build one step better, one step better. Um, where over the time and over multiple years, hopefully we have an opportunity to continue to build on the programming um that we've set forward so um peter i see your hand up um any thoughts or, or questions from your perspective yeah ron i just had a question you know i really really like the idea of bottom up top down approach from the top down how high up if any how in regards to hockey like usa hockey have you dipped your toe in that water yet at all so it's funny you ask that, especially timing. So right before this call, one of my teammates uh, in Chicago um, and our national team has been having national USA hockey conversations. So Peter, I don't know if you're, you've been part of that yet, but if you aren't, hopefully that will come up. Um, I actually have a call tomorrow with Dave Caruso, if you recognize that name, he now works for the Columbus Blue Jackets and helped build out a lot of the new um, USA hockey coach curriculum. Um, so I'm going to be talking to him tomorrow. So we're, we're getting there. I don't think we're quite at the point where we have a formalized partnership, but we do work with a lot of national governing bodies, um, in other sports, um, you know, throughout the country. So we work with, um, Jason helped me out with some of the ones specifically. I know we've worked with USA lacrosse. Um, we've worked with, um, U S soccer, U S yeah. almost football. every major sport. Uh, yeah, Pop Warner and Little League and yeah, because I think that's I think that's great because uh, I think one of the challenges that we face, you know, with your like your town organizations, uh, state organizations is like anything else, right? You're always looking to see what the top is doing, mm -hmm. right? When the top is actually recommending this, then it's so much easier to reference that and in a sense sell the idea at least you know to the organization so that's great yeah and, and peter i love the way you, you said that because really the national governing bodies unless there's a way to mandate training through the certification processes there's really not a lot of other power i would say in terms of implementing this workshop there's a ton of influence right a ton of influence and that influence i think is very important but where the power lays in the cultural work is really those the grassroots the board setting expectations providing training and resources to their coaches and parents to help them meet those expectations and then ultimately evaluating on those expectations right but those grassroots organizations the you know the i mean i'm in a i my son plays in rocky river youth hockey right i just signed a partnership with them yesterday here in the cleveland area their board has the power to make sure their coaches go through the training they also right. have the power to make sure that their parents go through the the parent workshop. We're going to actually tie that to their um, their might evaluation period, right? Where the kids are on the ice, we're taking the parents to a completely separate room during that hour and a half window, and we're going to do an hour long parent workshop and get them back to watch their kid through a completely different lens. So um, those organization boards have have the power to implement this programming. 
but if we have the influence of a governing body like USA Hockey or Hockey Canada, um, if there's no way to build it into, you know, obviously the coach expectations, that influence is tremendous. Sure. And you hear too, because that's one of the issues, at least with the town organizations, you hear too much of, well, you don't want to play for this organization because of this. You don't want to play for them because of that. As opposed to trying to turn this around and saying, you do want to play for them because they do this and that will fit your child. Your child, Absolutely. perhaps higher level, middle level, lower level, wherever they be, you want to play for them because they do this. That sounds great. That's perfect for my son or my daughter. But you hear too much of the the negative why you don't want to play and very little about why you do want to play. Absolutely. And, and that aligns, Peter, with the way it, we in our conversation with a lot of organizations is, hey, you you can't stop kids from going to see if the grass is greener in another program. But what you can do is make sure you're watering your own lawn every single day. And if we can take control over the environment that our kids are within our own program, so that even if a kid goes to play in a AAA program or a AA program because it's a step up and they go and it's not the environment they expected it to be, they know when they come back to our program exactly what they're going to get and that it's intentional and it's built the right way. Um, and so that's what we're trying to do. Great. Uh, Barry, I see your hand up. Yeah, well, before, actually, before we go to Barry, let, let's let Jason uh, just comment on the mission statement thing uh, so we don't lose track of that. Yes. I think you did it, uh, you're aware of it, Jason, with Wally, and maybe just comment on how that, you know, sort of dovetails with, what, what you guys do. Yeah, and I'm keeping an eye on my email for if that other person joins my other Zoom, I'll jump, but it, it's possible they'll they'll diss me because that happens sometimes too. So I'll keep an eye on that. In the meantime, yeah, so so um, while he took me through, was it yesterday I think we spoke, this activity that essentially has a couple of important components to it that tie into a lot of things that where PCA focuses as well. One of them is message bombardment. Right. There's a mission statement on a magnet that sits in a visual visual spot in the home of, you know, parents and whatnot. And, um, you know, it reminds them of the mission and the mindset and the culture that you're trying to create. And um, message bombardment in any form is just an undervalued aspect of learning. You know, we can't assume that if we say something out to the world one time, the world's going to absorb what we said. Um, it, the things that we say get absorbed differently depending on the timing of it, the way you word it, the frequency of, of, of the message and things like that. And so um, there was also a component that was really cool that essentially took sort of column A and, and column C and used a line to connect A, a components to C components and essentially referring to that line as the process. And I think that um, recognizing that this all is a process um, and it's not, you can't say for sure how long that process will take and it could take different paths and things like that. But at the end of the day, we're talking about really wanting to, this word has come up a lot in this conversation, but we're trying to affect culture. So you don't snap your fingers and affect culture. You don't quote, a great line that you saw on an Instagram ad somewhere in Effect Culture. It might inspire you in a moment, and it could even be a mantra that you follow, but in, in it, reading it one time isn't going to affect culture. It's going to take a process. And one of the things I did like about your activity, Wally, is that it, it put a lot of focus on the process, goal setting, um, recognizing, you know, sort of um, being proactive in your thoughts about what it is that you need to do today to work to be a step closer to that goal by tomorrow and, and then kind of re rinsing and repeating that each day. And um, so I think that you'd find that within PCA, there's a lot of those kinds of things different. Um, and Wally's activity was, you know, as, as a solo activity was really comprehensive. I think he said in its entirety, it could really take up to two hours to, to go through it and do it. And then Wally's version is, brought down closer to 45 minutes to an hour. Um, but I think any activities that combine message bombardment with sort of the baby steps, which is kind of like that mastery mindset. What do I need to do at this at bat? What do I need to do right now with the puck, given my options and like right now, right now, right now, right now, and the series of the right now decisions become the process. 
and so I really liked the activity that Wally had had taken me through the other day. And I think more and more and more creative ideas like that work better for this next generation as well, as they are. They want the visuals. They want the activity and kinetics of learning. And so, yeah, it's my two cents on that. I thought, I thought it was great. Go ahead, Barry. <laughs> thanks, Jason. Yeah, uh, thanks. We've uh, we've done Wally's workshop a number of uh, different times, Jason, different ways within our organization, and actually, uh, last year we ended up inputting it as part of um, our our beginning coaching clinic, so our coach one and two and development one, and uh, also put it into uh, our HP one. So really from a branch level, um, we, we recognize and understand the importance of uh, why as coaches uh, they're getting involved. And the word culture maybe is, uh, is overused somewhat in, in that way, but certainly with us working with short-term competition teams, it's so important for coaches to recognize and understand that's the building block of the beginning of the process is who they are, their values, uh, how they're going to coach, how they're going to make every decision they make. I, I'm really um, intrigued by uh, the workshops, Ryan, that you ended up talking about. And I guess I'm asking maybe from a branch level uh, involvement like uh, how and uh, time and cost and things like that, if you could maybe lay that out a little bit for me. So uh, I'm going back to my bosses. Uh, I can give them an idea of what's going on and what we might be able to do and use uh, through your organization. Yeah, absolutely. I'm more than happy to answer that. But real quick before I do, Tim, was there any Timothy? Was there anything that you wanted to add to Barry's? Uh, sorry, yeah, just I just wanted to interject because I stuck it in the chat there, and um, you know when we talked about culture, and I think Morris Lukowitz was the one that originally brought this up with our group, but. I really love it. It's from Pat Quinn, a long time, very highly respected NHL coach. You know, what is culture? Culture in his mind was very simply who we are and what we do. And it's a really easy thing to carry in the front of your brain as a coach all the time. As Jason said, it's really important to, you know, continually touch on what your culture is, what your values are as a coach and as a team and as an organization. But I, I really like that. It's very simply who you are and what you do. So it's I, love, I love that, Timothy. I think with the way we define culture through Positive Coaching Alliance is simply put the way we do things here, right? It's That's it. The way we act, the way we follow up, the way we communicate, the way we just the way we do anything here is really what our culture is and what our focus is. And, and that, unfortunately, is if we don't, if we aren't intentional about that, it happens, but it's oftentimes when it just happens, it's oftentimes not what we want it to be. And so we don't have control of the way we do things here. And that's where we're really trying to, um, to build in. Um, Wally, do you have something to add? Because I, I want to make well, sure you I, I, I didn't. Uh, before you went to Barry's question, uh, I wanted Kim to introduce herself. She's a former uh, national team uh, player. And she's running uh, the largest female hockey program as a coach, director, mentor in Toronto. And, and, uh, and then you can proceed with uh, Barry's question, but I'd sure like Kim to introduce herself. She's one of the, the more cerebral members of our group. So go ahead, Kim. Uh, Sorry. Kim, Kim, your mic's off. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, see, cerebral, but can't turn the mic on. Um, hi everyone, sorry I'm late, uh, was busy running hockey things, uh, tryouts are just coming around the corner, so everyone's crazy, um, so that's fun. Uh, I'm Kim, I'm in Toronto, as Wally said, I played pretty high level, I've coached uh, the last 15 years, um, mostly midget and junior, and now my daughter at U9B, which has been an awesome adventure. I'm the director of coach and player development at Leaside, which is the biggest girls hockey association. And um, I also run total female hockey. So uh, tons of skills and information uh, tailored specifically to coaches and players in the female game. So 
Don't ask me any questions about guys hockey, but everything else I'm pretty good on. I love that. Kim, thanks so much for being here. And uh, my wife is a hockey player, so I love what you're doing. And if you get a chance to say hi to Haley Wickenheiser or Danielle, go ahead for me. Um, if you ever see them in the Toronto area, please do. I got to work with them at the University of Calgary. So um, just incredible, incredible women in the game. Um, Wally, if it's okay, I definitely want to make sure to, to hit on Barry's question unless there's... Oh, please. Yeah, I wanted Kim to get her introduction in. She's uh, Barry, Barry's question by all means. Fantastic. And, and Kim, real quick, I, I would love to connect with you individually offline too, because we do whole, have a whole uh, gender equity initiative um, that we're building with Positive Coaching Alliance. So there may be some great tools and resources within that um, that uh, might be of value to you as well. Um, so we'll definitely circle back on that. Um, but Barry, to, to answer your question about really the, the how and, and when and all that type of, type of thing, um, a lot of times we try to meet programs where they're at, right? So if there's any existing coach gatherings, if there's um, preseason coaches meetings, that's usually the best opportunity for us to implement our programming. So all of our workshops are built to be typically 90 minutes to two hours in duration. Again, like Jason said, they're dialogue based. They're more conversation based. We don't want to just throw information at people and present at coaches. We want to generate their thoughts and help direct them in a more meaningful manner. So anytime there's an existing gathering of coaching where we can add significant value, we want to try to do that. Obviously, a lot of our partners will build um, specific opportunities for us to come in. And, and when I say come in, we have the ability to do the workshops that Jason mentioned in person, where we actually send the trainer physically to your location or virtually via Zoom. Um, so we do have the ability, uh, which is, is particularly nice if your coaching circle is geographically spread out and an in-person meeting is really difficult, that virtual option is, is a great additional option. Um, similarly with the parent piece, um, you know, anytime there's pre-existing parent gatherings, whether again, it's a preseason parent meeting, whether it's, um, there's tryouts for different organizations and, and we can take, it's, it's funny the way parents think, they think if they go to something that it might increase the chance of their kids actually making the team. Um, so, you know, we try to find ways to kind of meet them where their mindset is. And so, um, but we do also have, you know, the online courses, if there's individual focus, um, you know, there's some organizations, Jason, I typically don't recommend using our, our programming in a uh, reactive manner where we're trying to correct behavior through it. We want to obviously try to be proactive and help educate before issues happen. But there are some instances where, you know, if we need to have a hierarchy of correctional intervention um, for parents or for coaches, our online course can be a part of, of that um, intervention process. So there's a number of different ways of, of how our programming can be implemented. And that how really depends on each individual organization um, and what those opportunities are that, that exist. And so we can talk through that uh, more holistically. In terms of the cost, um, it's unique in the sense that we actually never charge what it costs us to deliver programming. Um, so we use our national philanthropic model to basically underwrite programming. But what that cost is, is entirely dependent on the scope of the work that we get to do with any organization. So um, what is the, what are the deliverables? What are, um, are we using, you know, online courses? Are we doing live interactive workshops? What is that scope? And so the way our pricing model is, is basically the more work we get to do with your program, the more years we, that that program commits to partnering with PCA and, and, and helping shape their culture, the less we charge you directly and the more we use our philanthropic model to make it work. Um, obviously in Canada with the vast majority of our trainers, actually I think all of our trainers are, are south of the border here in the United States, um, which is a different south of the border for Jason, but um, we, there would be a, if we did an in-person workshop, there would have to be a cost of travel associated with that. Um, but we try to keep that as minimal as humanly possible. So, um, so the cost per workshop can really range depending on, on the scope, um, you know, of that work. But I can tell you just to give you a general ballpark, um, 
you know, we're working within a program, a cost, I, I use a cost per workshop, but that's not really how we build it out. But a general general guideline, the cost per workshop can range really anywhere from about a thousand dollars US to eighteen hundred dollars US if it's a one and done check the box, say we did it type of workshop, which we try to completely avoid um, because we want to commit to uh, to culture. But hopefully that gives you kind of a a general range and it can really range anywhere in between whether we're doing online courses versus live interactive workshops what the scope is, but hopefully that helps give a general um, ballpark to, to kind of wrap your mind around. Good. Um, uh, <laughs> this came from sort of almost your last comment. Um, all of the people that you use to do your workshops are all south of the border. Why mm -hmm. is there nobody in Canada? Is there no interest? Have you never looked this way or? I think yeah. Go ahead, Jason. I off mute. I wasn't sure. I can't find my button there. But um, yeah, I think it's just a matter of practicality in a sense that, you know, the overwhelming majority of our partners exist in the States. Um, internationally, which is um, Canada is our neighbor, of course, but still like we don't have outreach to Canada. We don't know who's running the schools. What are all the youth sport organizations called and who's running those organizations? So we have no opportunity right now to proactively outreach, for example, to Canada and Canadian organizations. And so the number of partners that we end up there just through natural process is fewer than where we can proactively market ourselves. And um, so with fewer partners up there, the cost to get a trainer on board combined with, you know, Canada is a big country like the US is. So even if we get somebody in Toronto is that person going to be the go-to Canada person? It's one thing if you're a small island nation or something like that, you know. But for Canada, it's almost easier. It's it is easier to just take a Seattle-based trainer to fly up to or drive up to Vancouver than to bring the Canadian person who's in Toronto all the way over there. So it gets a little tricky. Like if we're going to have trainers in Canada, you know, where are the partners? Where's the sort of um, you know, density of, of partnerships and the handful of partners that we have up in Canada fairly spread out. Um, but Hal had mentioned that he used to be a trainer and before he jumped off, he mentioned to me that he wants to kind of dig back in again. So maybe we'll have at least at least Hal on board. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, Barry, I mean, the simplest reason, we were founded out of Stanford University. Um, and so we were founded here in the US and, and really pre-pandemic, we were a chapter model organization. Um, so we had 14 Jason chapters, I think, around the country um, that were our primary focus areas for impact. Basically, anything within a two hour radius of that chapter um, is what that geographic focus was. And certainly we did, to Jason's point, some, I mean, we were doing work really in all 50 states and across Canada and in different areas, but that was more organizations that found out about found out about us through other means and proactively reached out to us versus us <laughs> reaching to them. Um, obviously, since the pandemic hit, we've, we've actually dissolved our chapter model and picked up a more national and regional based model. So Jason and I have different territories that we focus on um, in growing. And so we're starting to build out more of that proactive outreach. And I'm certainly trying to do a little bit more of that um, in Canada and certainly tap into personal relationships that I've, I've generated, obviously, through playing you know, youth sports there and, and working at the University of Calgary and so on and so forth. So we're starting to build that out, um, but we're not where we want to be in that regard um, as of yet. And so my hope is if and when we, we grow the way I want to in Canada, we'll be able to justify the need for hiring trainers in Canada. But right now, to Jason's point, with the geographical spread out region and just the the lack of volume of work we're doing there right now. Um, it just doesn't make sense to, to add people and, and more to not just from our end, but we'd hate to have a trainer go through our entire process and they only get two or three workshops a year um, because of their time and their commitment and all that side of things. So we wanna make sure we're building it out and that anybody who becomes a trainer is going to feel like they're deeply connected and making the impact that they want to. And, and that's really the reasoning for them to become a trainer. So hopefully okay, that. Well, that, Go that's good. I, I think, um, you know, from the Hockey Alberta perspective, certainly, like I say, I can bring this back 
and share with them. But it's something maybe that, and on this call, there's a few people that, that suddenly, hey, to be a trainer might be something that's worthwhile uh, to end up doing, I guess myself included. Um, I'm going to have to get off here in a bit. So thanks. And maybe uh, through Wally, I'll be able to connect with uh, either you or Jason again uh, once I meet with uh, my group, uh, share what I've learned this morning, and, uh, and then maybe take, take it a little bit step further. That Thanks. sounds great, Barry. I, I'd love to connect with the individual offline for sure. So I'll make sure that I get your contact information from Wally. Okay. Thanks, Barry. Ryan. Thanks so much. Thank you, Barry. I want, um, I mm. want to uh, connect what you've been talking about related to what Ryan's been talking about. Uh, Ryan, I think as you would know, uh, <clears throat> Barry, <clears throat> Hockey Alberta has trained course conductors. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure those course conductors could do ethical coaching modules. They're familiar with technical modules. Uh, I've created the mission statement exercise with the hope that it become a mandated 45 minute. And as I talk to Jason, it can be two hours easily. Uh, it's an exercise to create the culture and understanding of the group. But we've not been able to educate our course conductors on that. We've been spinning our wheels since 1990 when this exercise was created. Oh. Um, the people on board here, all of us, would be capable, being like-minded, of fulfilling whatever modules you had, I'm sure, because we talk that, we walk the talk that we do every week. And that's why we exist for the good of the game. That's why you exist. It's in turmoil. And uh, I just wanted to mention that because politically, I've been trying since probably the year 2000 to convince our national governing body, which I worked for, to implement that particular mod model, which was created by them but failed to be implemented and it was just a timing of change of leadership thing and it slipped through the cracks so i wanted to get that in in terms of editing this broadcast to promote the cause and the good of the game and in particularly the positive coaching alliance so i'm glad you stayed on barry and barry has taken that exercise and maybe you can mention barry before you leave uh, you're in charge of the high performance on the male side now, but female before. But he's incorporated these ideas into that work and had results with it, I believe. Barry, can you comment? Yeah. Um, so we have um, grassroots programs. So there's eight. Um, uh, we divide the province up. So our second year U13s go into an event called Prospects Cup, and then our second year U15s go into the Alberta Cup, and there's six teams there. So there's 14 groups that we end up working with every year from the grassroots program. Uh, so that part of it, and actually it's funny, I was working on it this morning, just changing a few things uh, to simplify it, um, but all on mission statement, vision, values, and making decisions because they're all in the planning process now. The, the, the selection camps happen in a, about six weeks and then the competitions in about two months. So each team is now spending time as a staff to prepare for the selection camp. And then once that is over, uh, they get a team training day and then they go to an event. So really there's not a lot of time to spend with the players. So everything that I give them has to sort of be really uh, centralized and, and fairly simple to be able to use. So one of the things that I started two or three years ago, uh, two years ago was exactly that was the mission, vision, values stuff. And uh, just really making it where every staff had to end up doing it. That was their first uh, project. Um, and then they started to learn about each other as it went through a SWOT and a disc analysis and things of that nature. But uh, it, it really, I think, has made a difference. We have mentors for each one of the teams. So we have 14 mentors as well that I work with. 
and I communicate a lot with them. And one of the things that I'm finding is that exercise has really made a difference um, with the way that these staffs uh, work within each other. And then obviously when they go to the event, um, the decisions that they end up making. And again, you know, the definition of what culture is, that's exactly what it is. Why are we playing every player in every role? Because that's what we're here to do is develop all players. That would be an example of a value uh, that they're using through the mission statement uh, exercise. So I, that's where I see the value in everything that you brought out. And I, I do some work as well with some communities in that. And a big one there is the parent side of it is uh, we're, we're really struggling. Uh, I'm coaching a U13 team this year, helping out. And we thought we had a great year going and suddenly we get a couple parents that are that are uh, trying to be renegades and uh, doing things and trying to get other people involved. And it's uh, it's one of those things that we're all facing. So I guess long and short of it, Wally, thanks, I guess, for letting me explain sort of what I do and where I'm at. Our Team Alberta program, we're going to PEI next week for Canada Winter Games. And we've been through that whole process uh, as a staff early on, and we've done it now with the players uh, on a couple Zoom calls. Uh, so again, we brought them all together, and hopefully it ends up working out when we get there that we follow what uh, what we've ended up talking about as a group, and good things happen there as well. So thanks again. I'm on for another uh, about five minutes, and then I have to go. So thank you both very much. And uh, Wally and Tim, thanks for getting me on this morning. Barry, thanks so much for Thank sharing you. that. Good luck in PI. Uh, thanks. Safe travels too. Thanks. Yeah, and when you do connect with Ryan, one thing that I would suggest you talk about is what PCA calls a culture keeper. Might help with those with those parents. Mm -hmm. Okay. The side there. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I, I jotted down a lot of things as you were talking, Barry, that I think we can connect mm -hmm. our offline. So yeah. we'd we'll love to do that. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Ryan, I don't mean to interrupt but uh, Tim is and culture keeper J Jason uh, I, be I believe and Tim is the one that's proposed that every sporting association they have coach directors like Kim in her area and it's related to X's and O's but she's also done the exercise and could tell amazing stories about its effectiveness mm. but Tim has suggested every organization needs more than a technical co uh, leader, an ethical leader. So having an ethical director organizationally is, to me, an important part of changing the way we do things. And it starts with coach education and that mission statement exercise that creates an understanding of what are we here for, what are we doing. So I just want to throw that in. We've talked about that, Jason. Um, I, I believe the culture keeper, in my mind, when you said that, bang, I thought of it immediately. Organizations just trip, stumble, backtrack. They all start with great intentions. They love their kids. They want the best for their kids. But the score clock takes over. The outcomes take over. They lose sight of the what they're there for and the process it takes to win. And one of the reactions to PCA, not by me, oh, it's just play for fun. Well, it's play to win, but play for fun. Have more enjoyment doing it. I mean, you win championships that way. Yeah. So yeah, we do, we do combat that with the name, especially with the word positive in it. Some people have sort of a negative reaction to the word yeah, positive because yeah. they think it's all soft. And um, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, if we're talking about, hey, through our work together, we can develop one's self-control, resilience, problem-solving skills. Like, why do there are studies on why kids play? Why they? What creates the fun for them? It's the act of competing. It's the solving problems within this game. Hockey, people are moving all over the place all the time, which means the solution to the problem. If I get the puck one second from now, is going to be different than the solution five seconds from now because everybody's moved. The whole situation has changed. My decisions will change, et cetera. But that constant like problem solving is, is what creates the fun for them. It also, though, is a big part of how they perform as hockey players or basketball or soccer players or whatever the sport would be. Um, 
getting kids to play without the fear or compete without the fear of making mistakes. That's going to bring out a huge skill set from them. Like we can coach to win a game and maybe be successful winning that game. Or we can coach to get the most out of each individual on this team. Go fit, go challenge that glass ceiling and kick it down and find the next marker and ask that marker some questions and do that every day that we show up together. We're going to win a ton of games with this mindset. We're also seriously developing our hockey, hockey players into better competitors and also better hockey players through that process. So I, I, Wally, I totally agree that some people have that reaction and I think we need to get across to them that you could be Bobby Knight throwing chairs out onto the court and win, but that'll win by getting just enough out of people to stay off your radar. Yeah. But is that really the goal? I mean, we know the term coach comes from stage coach. You're here. You want to get there. I can help you yeah. get there. So if that's where the goal comes from, if that's, that's where the term comes from, we don't get them there by throwing chairs. We get them there by making them better independent problem solvers, team-wide problem solvers, play and compete without the fear of making mistakes, react and adjust to those mistakes, and all those kinds of things. Tom. Yeah. Yeah, I just I wanted to just mention Wally did that mission statement with my uh, with my parents while I was running a practice, and what happened with it? They decided to have two elite, you know, U thirteen girls teams in Calgary, and these parents had never they'd always coached their kids. They'd never had a outside coach, and there was a lot of uh, you could tell a negativity that who is this guy coming in and. You know, and uh, like one of my assistant coaches is Cassie Campbell, who's on the Canada board for the whatever. But uh, I, you know, like we had to, I let them know that we had a coaching staff already. And if I needed somebody, you know, I'll give them a call. And so the parents got together and said, if you want us to help, we need two weeks notice. And <laughs> so the first time I needed help, my son's a lawyer and he said, a client just came in. I can't come to practice. Well, that's a little less than two weeks. But uh, after Wally did that that statement, it just changed everything. And you know, I have a couple of parents come on the bench all the time, and and they just did an evaluation. Out of the you know, I get this evaluation. I didn't know they do an anonymous evaluation by all the parents, and eighty eight percent of them thought it was the greatest thing that's happening to their kids. And you can see there's one parent, nothing was good. Absolutely nothing. It's a terrible experience for me, for my child. For, and I, I'm sure so there's one guy stepped on the ice at the end of one of our practices and had his kids start doing skating lines. So I think he wants a lot of the bag skating that I don't do very much of whatsoever. But, you know, that... Now I go out in the hallway and stuff and the parents all talk to me and all this. And before that, it, you know, they just give me the old, I'd walk by, they turn their backs, you know, so it's made a human, you know, a huge, huge difference. And they just asked me, they're going to, they're going, they're going to uh, go in a provincial league next year because we play against boys and uh, gonna, going to have a provincial uh, league playing against girls around the province. And they're going to add another provincial team to the U15. And so anyways, they just asked me if I'd coach that team. And I said I would, but, uh, you know, that, and I've got, they made the fridge magnets, you know, with the mission statement on it. So it's a really effective thing. So I thought I should add that to the conversation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Michael, I saw you pop your hand up for a second. Was that on purpose or was that in an attempt to mute? Yeah, I was just trying to unmute, but uh, no, thanks guys for being on. Sorry, I was a little late, but uh, got to listen to it mostly in the car. Oh, wow, cool. Michael, thank you for making the connection and having these people on. Uh, you know, I, I'm i listening to everything and it's everything we've talked about, but you've put it together. And uh, we'd like to see how to get it make a bigger difference and have a bigger influence 
And well, like 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 what often happens on these calls, right? Is is this is the wrong audience to hear from PCA? <laughs> I mean, it's uh, you know it, I, that's how I I've I've you know obviously the synergies there, and I think to, to one comment uh, that I think everybody's making too, which is which is ironic that the the kids that benefit the most from this type of coaching, all of a sudden are the ones that think that now they're too good for the program they're in and they want to leave and go somewhere else. And then they, then they, that, that, then that's sucked out of them. Like the reason they are able to develop, the reason they're able to have freedom, the reason they're able to have creativity is because of the way you're coaching them in, in these, in, in this other, you know, mentality. And then they wonder why when they leave that, that their, their development stunts or, or they don't make it through that next ceiling. And I think it's just, you know, I know it's, it, it can't be just the grass is always greener. It has to just be a, uh, I think, you know, we brought it up last week on the call and, and when Wally brought it up, it's just a human condition, right? It's the, my, now my kid is better than the situation they were in. I really didn't even know why they got better. They don't, you know, the parents don't see the reason why that happened and then they just move on and then they wonder why that, that growth has, has stopped. Um, for many kids, not not all, you know, obviously other kids just progress because they're going to progress. But I just thought this would be a good, um, we talk about this type of stuff all the time. I know it, I've been back and forth with Jason quite a bit. And uh, I certainly think, I know here in the States, Wally, it's amazing as, as big as PCA is, how difficult it is to get, um, it's not even parents, because sometimes it doesn't even get to the parents, how right. difficult it is to get administrators to value a, a let's just say a $5,000 investment on this rather than another batting cage or, or, yeah. or a scoreboard or something like that. You know, it's just, to me, this is the, this is the base of your program. Yeah. And I know in the hockey world, it's, it's, I, I know, you know, I know we spend, you know, I, I do a, I do a series with uh, program directors on, on, you know, if you take one weekend of your, of one team's hockey tournament, one weekend of one team's hockey tournament, it comes to about sixteen thousand dollars in total costs for for a, for a team to go to a tournament in Minnesota, hotel, gas, the T-shirt, the sweatshirt, an extra stick, Mickey D's, and if you took that fifteen thousand dollar investment, what you could do with it in a program like yours, it's uh, again, it's frankly baffling to me. But that's why we're here, and I think that's why we continue to you know fight for these type of programs. Well, Mike, Michael, I appreciate that that perspective, and you're 100 right. And Jason, I could probably talk endlessly about our frustrations in, in this role um, and the challenges that we face, but it, it's important to do right. And at the end of the day, you know, Jason mentioned message bombardment, and at, at some point, like I've been here five years, there's some conversations that I had five years ago that now they're reaching out to me, going, "Okay, you're right." Um, and so it takes time and it takes continual effort and it takes continual conversation. And, you know, hopefully over time we get people there. Right. And, and it just, it, it's something that that endless pursuit, because we know it's the right thing to do and that constant education. And, and Michael, you said something that really resonated, um, is the why, right. And that's the important piece of education. Like our, our kids are athletes. We can't just tell them now as coaches what to do and expect them to do it. Like they want to know why they have to do it. They want to know why it's going to be beneficial, right? They're very, they're a lot more uh, curious, right? And they're a lot more intentional about their actions. And it's the same thing with the parents, right? If the parents don't understand why you make decisions the way you make them, they're going to jump to their own conclusions, right? And so that educational component of why and helping not necessarily like we're, we're really good at calling parents out, uh, but we use this phrase in PCA all the time of how do we call parents in, right? Like we need your help, right? We know parents are a problem. We know, you know, some coaches are a problem, but if we're going to change this, we actually, we need your help. We can't have you just tell talk about the problems. Like we need you to be part of the solution. Um, you know, and that education piece is, is massive. Yeah. Ryan, I just want to mention the, parent issue um the the gentleman who uh, actually created the mission statement exercise he borrowed it from um claire drake and i talked to jason about this the university of alberta dr murray smith the sports psychologist there and then they were implementing it in the 1990s early 
And uh, he's the one that, um, his name is Dan Morrow. He worked for the first ever Center of Excellence for Hockey Canada, run by the national team. So that exercise, and he was on staff and stayed on staff for the Center of Excellence. There was one, which was Hockey Canada, the national team. Then there was the Canadian Amateur Hockey Association. Eventually, there's five Center of Excellence. Hockey Canada moved over to take over the CHA, but the national team left. And the people that you would know the names, uh, Claire Drake, George Kingston, Dave King in Canada, that were the pioneers of coach, ethical coaching and technical coaching, they left. So it slipped through the cracks. Dan mentioned to me the thing he would do differently because he was coaching a peewee team with Dr. Bob Korn at the UFC at the time, whose son was on the team, and uh, they were having issues. And they did the exercise. It changed the culture, it improved the culture. And he said, he's going to retire soon and get back into coaching. And the thing he would do differently is leave the players in the dressing room with the assistants and go out and talk to the parents. And it's the same thing as Tom. I could see their disgruntledness with him because they've been involved. They care about their kids. They're giving of their time and they get to spend time with their kids. All of a sudden they can't. But since we did that exercise and I did it in a different way, it was just the parents. The coaches have to do it separately. And it's important when the parents do it, the coaches are held accountable. And if the parents become the creators of the statement amongst themselves and they listen to the parents who want the best for their kids initially. And uh, I think it's a, a really, it's something down the road, Jason, with a number of your people, I would love to do the exercise as an experiment, you can have it like, and do with it what you can, because it will, it will bridge that gap of communication between you talk top down, bottom up. I agree. We use the same terminology, but I also add inside out. And the inside out is the manager I'm doing this statement with another team, not, it's too late, but we're going to do it because next year there's going to be three teams of that age group. Those parents are going to go on and they've done the exercise and coaches are recruiting good parents to get on the board. So we're creating a culture of change and a positive change from the get-go. So I think it's, it's a way of getting to the governing body who has the power to make a difference. They're ready for Hockey Canada needs ethical coaching modules. We know that. And this is the kind of thing because all the time of just good uh, people who are there for the right reason in executive positions, leading associations, 90% of their time is spent dealing with problems. So it's a proactive activity before things go south. It prevents it. Wally, that word proactive is so vitally important. Yeah. Right. We're really good at being reactive and trying to fix things. Yeah. But the education piece is where the proactivity comes. Um, and I see Kim's hand up. Okay. Kim, and I'm going to ask Rick a question after. 